who are hiding out in our living spaces invisible to each other, except on Zoom, invisibility is going to be our theme in this special Halloween day right by night. Not the usual noir. In fact, not noir. So when I swore back in episode eight, murder your darlings, that it's going to be all noir all the time. I said a stupid thing. And I must have been lying. At least I own up to it when I've told a stupid lie. Unlike, never mind. We're doing not noir not noir era, going back to pre-code 1933, The Invisible Man, based on the 1897 sci-fi novel by the immortal H.G. Wells and directed by James Whale, who also directed, oh, um, let's see. Oh, hey, how about this? And Bride Of, with Claude Rains. Claude? Where's Claude? French that guy. I could be induced to. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And he is back in 1933. He starts his career in a speaking but not seen role. Here's Camus Jack Griffin's predicament. Like a fool. He experimented with the chemical monocrane and ingested it because he knew that it had powerful bleaching properties and he wanted to see if he could bleach himself invisible. But he didn't know that it also makes people mad or as we say nowadays, mentally ill. However, even before the monocrane. He was known to be extremely angry and antisocial. He worked in secret. He kept a lot of stuff locked in a big cupboard in his laboratory. He never opened that cupboard until he barred the door and drawn them blinds. Straightforward scientists have no need for barred doors and drawn blinds. He cares nothing for you, Flora. He'll never care about anything but test tubes and chemicals. How could he go away like this without a word? So I think that's just an excuse. I think that way before he became invisible, he was pathological already. And the invisibility just brought out his true character. Power, different forms of power can do that. A little of this injected under the skin of the arm every day for a month. An invisible man can rule the world. Nobody will see him come. Nobody will see him go. He can hear every secret. He can rob, break, and kill. (laughs) Now, this is billed as a horror movie. And, oh, man, horror movies have gotten a lot more horrifying since 1933. Okay, people, you get it? Stay away from that monocrane. One true noir element here, James Whale was influenced by German Expressionism. See that exaggerated contrast between shadow and light? So Jack Griffith wants to rule the world, but for a while it seems he can only come up with some schoolboy mischief. Then he does something really horrible. Families, mothers with infants in arms, a whole troop of Harvey girls could have been on that train. And now I really hate that invisible freaking psychopath. But when he meets his demise, as all criminally insane chemists who take a non-FDA approved potion must eventually. 
the one person he kind of likes, the woman who loves him is by his side grieving. But why does she still love him? Does she know about the train? I'm getting fed up with these women who stand by their worthless men, who are straight up criminals, and sometimes even help them in their crimes. I want women to be better than that, but you, you know what? I, I don't know if I should reveal this. Maybe best to keep it invisible. Oh, I'll just say it. The world doesn't always turn out the way I want. Invisible man, again, but no thee. I wasn't kidding when I said we're onto a theme, and the theme is invisibility. Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. I'm not complaining, nor am I protesting either. It is sometimes advantageous to be unseen, although it's most often rather wearing on the nerves. You often doubt you really exist. Invisible Man, first published in 1952, and here invisibility refers to race. Invisibility as a metaphor. What is it to go unseen. Of course, you're all going to do what you want to do and what you don't want to do. But if someone hasn't read Invisible Man, I, Lummis, recommend that you read it. So you should just do that. Meanwhile, these days among feminists, the invisible woman usually refers to what women become as they age, aren't oh, young and hot anymore, and maybe start looking like hell, like I'm starting to look like hell, some mornings especially. Yeah, people don't see you, that's true. Unless they know you, then sure, then they see you. But strangers, men, yeah, it's interesting. That light that used to open in their eyes, it's gone. And they look past you, look to see if there's somebody interesting somewhere else in the room. Invisibility. Of course, what I've just described, that's what you might call a first world problem, isn't it? Many Native American women in this country are disappearing into invisibility. Around Mexico City, the girls and women of Icatepec disappearing. And it is not a metaphor. Their bodies can't be found. And when bodies are found, they can't always be identified. Sorry to come in for such a hard landing, but it's the truth. And sometimes it's how the world turns out. Not how I want. Lawrence Robb, 
a poet of many collections of poetry, including What We Don't Know About Each Other, a finalist for the National Book Award, and his most recent, The Life Beside This One. He's received an NEA, a Guggenheim, the Bess Hoken Prize from Poetry Magazine. Lawrence Robb has influenced some notable Los Angeles poets, and in some way, he's influenced me, even though my work doesn't sound like his. So I can't explain the nature of his influence, but mysteriously, it's in there somewhere. He writes in an, uh, an uncommonly straightforward and unornamental voice, and yet his language isn't flat. It doesn't sound like dull prose. Often there's a searching, inquiring, or probing quality, a will to get down to the truth of a matter. And always he comes from empathy. So whereas I get disgusted with the homicidal chemist who got himself invisible and now can't find the solution to undo it and so blames everyone but himself, Rob comes at him from inside. And poetry-wise, it produces an interesting result. By Lawrence Rob, Death of the Invisible Man. At the end, he often returned to the amazement of watching himself disappear. An invisible man, he boasted to the air, can go anywhere he chooses, have anything that pleases him, have anyone he desires. He shuttered the lab and stepped into the night perfectly alone. Soon, he told himself, the world will know me. Above him, a window opened, a woman leaned out. She'd heard some noise in the street. A candle wavered in her hand. Shadows touched her face. How tender, he thought. He never doubted he had the skill to reverse his transformation and become a man like any other. Nothing worked. He grew careless. Forced to submit. In the weakness of his dying, he could only whisper. Yet, if a glass rose above his head and trembled, then flew at the feet of those who watched over him, they felt his anger. He was still there. But to himself, he was hardly present. If I were to walk out of this room, he thought, rain would fall through me. Windows would refuse to contain my reflection. Cold would pass me by. At the beginning, he'd been certain he would never tire of the invisible and of the way it set him apart from the rest, the ones who could so easily be seen and touch each other, as he wished now to be touched. It's a really beautiful poem. There is one other form of invisibility I didn't mention. The invisibility of being a gay man in the 1930s, which was a pretty rough time to be a gay man. And James Whale, who directed this movie, and Frankenstein, and The Bride of Frankenstein, and The Wolf Man, was a gay man in the 30s, making movies about monstrous creatures, which is interesting. There may be a metaphor there to explore the outsider, the outcast, the creature that horrifies others, the lonely creature. 
But, and this is something optimistic, something uncharacteristically noir. It's positive. He lived openly as a gay man in the 30s with his partner, and people knew it, didn't talk about it, of course, but it was understood. And he had a, essentially a, a marriage before marriage was ever legal between men in the 30s. So there is the last, well, there are others, but it's the last form of invisibility I can think of right now. I'm used up. I'm done. I'm finished. I got nothing left. Somebody else out there has something left, but I don't. So, you know the routine. Good night, ladies. Good night, gentlemen. And remember, look both ways, watch your step, and don't let anybody treat you like you're two for a dime.